Great. Right. Well, I want to extend a warm welcome to Clemens and Sarah, but also to you, the, the audience, for um, virtually connecting with us today on our first uh, New Voices in uh, Global Security seminar series of 2022. So happy to have Clemens as the, the first up. Um, so the for those of you who are unaware, the New Voices uh, Lunchtime Seminar Series is um, a King's College London School of Security Studies sponsored series that wants to uh, seeks to showcase uh, the expertise and the scholarship uh, across the School of Security Studies for a particular PhD and um, postdoc and other early career researchers. Um, again, so we're so uh, grateful that Clemens has agreed to be a part of this series. Uh, if you really enjoy his presentation, which I'm sure you will, um, you'll have to then check out his blog post that will be forthcoming um, based on this presentation, but maybe, maybe a bit more details with um, the Critical Military Studies uh, Journal. So um, that's, that will be forthcoming, so watch this space. Um, my name is Amanda Chisholm. I am a senior lecturer across the School of Security Studies and researching and teaching on gender and global security. I'm also the um, chair and organizer of this series. So today, um, Clemens has, uh, will be talking about some of his really uh, great empirical work um, from arising from his PhD fieldwork. Uh, and the title of this talk is The, In the Interdependence of Research and Border Politics. Uh, Clemens, for those of you who don't know, is a researcher at the Austrian Institute of International Affairs and a doctoral student at the University of Vienna, funded by the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he was just really recently a visiting student here in the Department of War Studies at King's College London from September until just December. Uh, and his work in his work, Clemens engages with the intersections of politics of border and mobility control and the politics of research and development of security, security technologies. Uh, Clemens today is joined by our uh, esteemed discussant, Dr. Sarah Perret. Um, Sarah is a research associate at the Department of War Studies, working on an Economic Research Council project, Security Flows, enacting border security in the digital age, political lives from or of data forms, flows, and frictions. And in this project, Sarah studies the transformation of knowledge through practices of digital insecurity at the borders and the effects of datification on EU border security practices. Uh, beyond this, Sarah has taught in several French universities and at Georgetown University as well, and she's also been a visiting researcher at George, Georgetown University BMW Center for the German and European Studies during her doctoral studies. In parallel to this, uh, her, uh, her impressive academic CV, she's also been parliamentarian advisor at the French Assembly Nationale and a co um, consultant at the World Bank on government and public policies in West Africa. And she's also been a, a ministerial advisor on equality and social diversity in the minister, our Ministry of National Education, Higher Education and Research. So, so um, grateful that Sarah is able to, to be a discussant for um, Clemens today. Again, warm welcome to you both. Um, Clemens has agreed to talk for roughly 20-ish minutes, um, for which after that, Sarah will uh, provide some feedback on the paper that um, Clemens has sent her uh, ahead of time and, and I'm sure the presentation. Uh, in the meantime, you, the audience, if you have any um, questions, comments, or whatnot during, you know, um, just please uh, pop them in the Q and A or the chat box. And uh, once once um, Sarah is done providing her um, comments, we'd open the floor to to have uh, Clemens respond to those. So warm welcome again to everyone. And without further ado, Clemens, I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to you. All right. Yeah, let me just share my screen quickly. All right, there we go. So can then everybody see it? I think so, perfect. All right, yeah, so um, as Amanda already introduced, I'm dealing more or less in this talk with the intersections of the politics of research and development and the politics of border security and um, more or less try to uncover uh, how um, in, Re security research programs that deal with technologies for border security. Um, some forms of bordering are reproduced, reified, um, and I want to uh, more or less focus both on my frame, my research framework, but also on 
you know the empirical findings and the topic and, and bring this a bit closer to you um therefore i structured the talk into three major bullet points i would say the first one would be the introduction of the political environment um uh, the second part would focus more on the problematization which is means more focusing on my research um, and the third one would be a preliminary analysis, analysis of my findings. Um, I say preliminary because I'm just in, you know, the final gasps of my PhD and there is still a lot of um, final analysis to be done. So there, um, there might still be some new things coming up. Thus, I say preliminary, but of course, um, yeah, there is. Okay, let me see. Um, yeah, so the first point, introducing the political environment. Um, what you can see here on this picture is two examples of technologies that derived out of some form of research that got used at the border and that also became quite critically uh, problem, uh, problematized um, in the last few years. Um, and I will start actually with the picture on the right hand side, which is um, sonar cannon that um, there was a video circulating um, this year, I think past year in, in, in 2021, um, where a sonar cannon was used at the Greek land border to Turkey to deter migrants from crossing the border. Um, you can imagine this in it making a really loud sound that is actually deafening and um, I, I would say it's a uh, it's a health hazard to deter um, people from crossing the border. Um, and while this was not um, developed in an EU funded research program, it is still, I think, a, a good example of seeing what technologies are used at the border and to give you a sense of what is um, dealt with in, in this regard. And the left one is actually a uh, EU funded border security project, which uh, was one of those that also get a, a bit of media attention. It's called I Border Control, and it's mainly focusing on uh, based on artificial intelligence on, um, you know, uh, it's a lie detector more or less. So um, the border guard in this sense is not um, a person anymore, but it's an artificial intelligence which asks questions, which based on the algorithms that um, are programmed in there should detect if somebody's lying or not. And this, of course, was hugely problematized. But this is one of the projects that I think it was funded in Horizon 2020. Um, and, and then it was largely problem, problematized. So yeah, just to give you a sense. Uh, and to give you another sense is what does, um, the, how does the EU see it? Um, see the role of security research in border security and in security in general. And I have two quotes. The first one is from the um, EU Ad Agenda on Security, which was issued in 2015 by the Commission, which uh, I will not read the entire quote. You can uh, probably do this yourself, but just to line out, the most important thing is that uh, research is essential to keep up to date with security needs. So the first sentence is really important, but also it contains um, the problems that are and and the, the thoughts the the imaginations that go in there when you when the EU thinks um, research as a solution and the word solution comes um, you come across when you do this research quite often to do to a word of solution and the other thing is in the second quote which was issued in one of the reports on the um, implementation of the security union um, is how security research is one of the building blocks, but also focusing on the uh, competitiveness and on the build up of the European security industry. This has been a long endeavor by the European Union, um, also in terms of uh, an own security industrial policy, which dates back to 2012 and has not been renewed since, which I will also address a bit later. But um, so research is, is more or less following a few objectives in there and I will um, line this out a bit um, in in the next slide which um, where I describe now the relevance of uh, research and development in border security and I think that the major relevance of why it is important to look at those processes is because the um, external border and thus external border control. So we always speak of the external border because as you know through Schengen the internal border controls have more or less um, been 
um, stopped and it all focuses on the external border of the Schengen area. Um, and I think that quite a few um, people are from the UK here, so you, you, you're very familiar with that. Um, and it is thus struck infrastructure and there is this uh, um, great body of literature on infrastructuring the border, which I think is worth drawing on to um, and to a variety of technological systems. So, and there are two logics. The one is more or less surveillance logic, which focuses more or less on large scale movements as the EU describes it, where the European border surveillance system, Eurosur is I think the, ma the major tool in there, but there is also this more database and biometric um, way of controlling the border. And there is a lot about individualized mobility control with a variety of da databases and, and information systems. Um, and there were great, talks on those information systems in the in the course of new voices um, already. Um, so I'm not going to delve too deep into this, but just so you know that there is a lot of, of um, development in this area going on um, in terms of new information systems coming up, like a travel information authorization system. Um, and as you saw from the quotes before, um, it is research and innovation that is described as paramount in tackling and it's also that those systems need to be um, again from an EU standpoint um, up to date in order but there is also this networking of different actors so it's not only industry it's also there is a strong endeavor to bring secu security practitioners in to make those um, pro uh, projects and the products of the projects more usable in the end um, and <clears throat> of course there's also a um, big endeavor to bring in researchers in this to um, scientifically base those policies and the, the progress. Um, so where does, does the research and development then happen in the European Union? Um, as you can see on the right side, it is mainly the framework programs, the large framework programs where I think we all, uh, as an academic community, we all touch upon them at some point. Um, it started with the seventh framework program where really security research was established. And it got more and more institutionalized with Horizon 2020 and now with the current Horizon Europe program. And all in all, EU funded security research, uh, security research represents 50% of all security research in the EU, with the other 50% mainly being national programs, but not on uh, all member states do have national programs. In fact, I think it's only six or seven um, Germany, France, but also smaller countries like uh, the Netherlands or even Austria do have national security research programs. And, and the budget for border security specific calls, it's also is always um, in a, so the calls are always issued in a time span of two to three years. So um, in, from 2018, the last Horizon 2020 call, it was 40 million euro. And now for the first Horizon Europe call, it's 31 million euro for two years. So it's actually been increasing a bit, but not that much, which also um, has to be seen in the larger context of <clears throat> the research budget in the EU actually being cut. Um, and so that's that's for the for the large structure. So for the smaller, um, more micro level structure, there are a lot of projects that get funded in there, of course. Um, and those projects are usually large consortia that consist of aforementioned researchers, secu security practitioners, and industry companies who work together in those pro uh, projects for uh, a couple of years. Mostly, it's like three to five year projects um, in order to derive. Not, it, it, it's not necessarily one device that comes out there, but it can be platforms, it can be systems that come, that come there, it, it can build on already existing systems, um, and they follow um, different techno uh, technological trajectories. What is also there is that those projects are usually, they have a policy hook, so it's strongly connected, and I will come to this uh, at, at the next slide, but just um, to mention this. So the projects that you can see on the right side, they were all, um, more or less viewed with quite a bit of interest by uh, security practitioners also to implement them, which made them interesting um, to look at. But I also looked at other projects, but just, just a few examples. Um, so what makes research and development then political in this um, sense? Um, as I said, those 
the calls already that are issued by the commission, they are connected to strategic and policy goals. You could describe this as a policy driven research, but it is important because this um, reflects also in the proposals that are written and then of course in the in the longer term in the project and in the technologies that are uh, and in the solutions that are developed there that there is always this policy hook um, where um, research is actually determined or not not determined but at least partly produced and shaped by um, by policies um, and also the calls are formulated by the input of security actors. So what we have, what, what is, uh, is quite observable is that all the larger um, agencies that deal with border security in the European Union, and it's mainly Frontex and EU LISA who, who deal with this, uh, they have established specific research units who do their own research, but who are also some sort of connection node for uh, research projects that get funded under the under the framework programs. They do events where they invite um, <clears throat> project leaders to present their projects um, and possibly implement and procure them. So um, you can see this, and there is a, a, an even stronger case, which I will come to in a second. But it's it's um, what is important in there is that. Um, this node in the agency is also quite important because secur security act is more on the national base. So I don't know, let's say the Italian Coast Guard, the Romanian border police, um, the Polish border police um, are often involved in those consortia as, and this is um, a term that is quite prevalent in policy circles as so-called end users, um, because um, so this stems from the desire of the European Union to make the projects more marketable, which is why they bring those so-called end users in to improve um, the usability um, of the projects, which um, has been a long goal and which um, has also been a problem in those research programs, as I will outline a bit later. Uh, and I think the major example of how research and development has even shaped the institutional framework is that within the uh, Directorate General Migration and Home Affairs, in short, teaching home of the European Commission, there is now a specific unit. Um, I think it has been established in 2013 or so, um, which basically acts as the interface between security and the research domain. So um, this unit more or less is dealing with security research, but it is so close to the operational units that they, um, can they, they communicate on the operational needs of um, technology research and then communicate it to the uh, Director General Research and Innovation who sets up the, the research programs. So with that being said, how do we problematize this? And this is where, where my research comes in. What did interest me in researching this? It's first the intersections of border control and research and development and i feel like there is a mutual constitution of the border as i said institutions have already been shaped by this by implementing research and establishing research units but also policies do profit more or less from um the available technologies and they are shaped by this and in the end it's also of course the practices the underground practices um, which are shaped by the available devices and how you could control the border. So the border as such is shaped by research and development, but also as we know now, um, research and development is shaped by the politics at the border. Um, the other interest that I have is uh, the role of the different actors in the networks. Um, so what does it mean when security acts and industry work together? I mean, they have similar interests, but also quite distinguished interests. So it's um, different interests. So it's interesting just to look into how does this communication work also with, uh, within the project level, but also more on a macro political level. Um, also what I wanted to do is um, to problematize the, uh, and I borrow this term, techno-solutionism, which is promoted in the research and development programs, because uh, I feel like, um, policymakers rely too strongly on we just innovate and then all the situations of crisis at the border will go away because technology will use this and this connects to uh, a perpetuation of perpetuation of racialization exclusion discrimination and violence at the border because 
if we grasp the border as an inherently racialized and exclusionary and violent tool, uh, of course, technologies that emerge out of a specific regime um, reify those problematic notions. Um, so how can we describe bordering through um, research and development? Again, this connects to the technological infrastructuring of the border. Um, quoting uh, Etienne Balibar with this, where the border is everywhere. So you could see that the border is in a, in a laboratory, the border is in a boardroom where a project gets done, just you know, to make this clear. It's the process of bordering is the interesting thing here. And this also happens with, um, you know, at any stage of the research um, process. Um, and thus the border becomes more of a, of a method and um, manifests in the borderscapes. So there is a temporal dimension of um, the border being at different stages where technologies get developed, but also used. And then the spatial is, is, is there is still a spatial dimension to every border. Even if we say it's not at the territorial border anymore, there is still a spatialization of this. Um, it's also important to see research and development not as a singular process, but it's a series of practices, because this comes from the policy level where the calls are formulated in negotiations to the proposal writing of the researchers, to funding decisions, to the actual development projects. Um, and the policy link I, I derive from um, more or less drawing on the concept of social technical imaginaries, because what interests me there is how the border is imagined in the policies and how um, the aforementioned solutionism is seen in those imaginaries. There is also a strong um, critical narrative of the imaginaries in there because the imaginaries do necessarily not include um, the negative uh, impacts of those um, innovate, uh, uh, so of, <clears throat> of innovation as um, a, a, a solution to, to problems. Um, which uh, I think is really important that we problematize and critique uh, research and development and not see it as a um, tool of modernism, so to say. Um, and there we, we have this, this um, very interesting, um, I would say, how could you say this? Um, it's a bit of a, if a dialectic where on the one hand you want um, the marketability through the in involvement of end users, but also the strengthening of the security industry. And I think this is dialectic in the sense that industry basically wants to sell quickly and make money and uh, easily, so quite broken, easily broken down. And uh, security practitioners need something to fulfill their tasks. And the interesting thing is how is this negotiated and also what are the common imaginaries that emerge out of this network? Um, because if they cooperate, there is clearly something that comes out together in terms of the projects. Um, and as I said, um, and I think that the, the other points can be summed up pretty, pretty much um, in the sense that through this techno solutionism, through this view of innovation as a one size fits all solution, more or less, um, it reifies and exacerbates the problematic tendencies of racialization, of exclusion, of violence. Um, and it's interesting for me to see where this happens. And there is this question of power, who defines the imaginaries, which links to the, um, to the networks, who has the power to formulate the calls. So it's more or less looking really into the fields um, and, and um, what goes on there. And therefore, it's quite interesting, I think, to, to, to show you how I did it um, and how oh, what were my methods. So what I tried to do is tracing the different stages of research and development. I did not only focus on the projects, but I tried to focus on the programs and even on the stage before on how policymakers who have nothing to do with research per se uh, view research in uh, their policy formulation implementation tasks. Um, so there is a, a focus on how the practitioners in the field perceive it um, in their everyday practices. Um, that's more or less what was my interest. And what I did for this was more or less analyzing documents for the objectives and uh, from the objectives um, outlined the social technical imaginaries. 
uh, doing qualitative field work, so doing interviews with a lot of people in different institutions. I also tried in the beginning to get into those events that I mentioned before with um, where the projects get um, presented to agencies, but with COVID, um, this all fell apart a bit. Um, so I did a bit more interviews. And when, once I got the data, I, I mapped it to discover the relations between the actors, the networks, to discover the discursive positions of the actors, their positionalities, um, and, and to also address the questions of power in the larger arena of research and development in border security uh, to um, you know, problematize how this, uh, those problematic tendencies get reified. So um, just to quickly sum up this, I want to give you a preliminary analysis of my findings. So what were my preliminary findings? Um, the, and, and that was really, really like the most interesting part of what I found out is that um, there is a really strong endeavor in strengthening um, research and development and the programs have been extended. However, the projects are rarely used and um, procured. And there are many reasons for that. Um, the one being that the timeframes from research and security just differ. So security practitioners would rather procure from the shelf if they need something. Um, there is also often the citation of how the civil industry lacks what the military and the defense industry has, which um, alludes to a strong desire of militarization uh, in this regard. Um, but there is a even if the projects do not materialize in, in uh, products in the end that are bought by security actors, there is still a strong network building between security practitioners uh, and the research um, slash industry side. Um, so the argument for this is marketability, but of course this shapes the entire politics at the border. Um, what I found also interesting is that discrimination and racialization are hardly perceived by anyone. So it's more or less an absent presence of race, um, the, the, which is a great, a great quote by, by Ahmad Njarek, um, where race is there, but it's mm, discursively omitted more or less. So nobody talks about it. Uh, when you talk to people about fundamental rights issues, they tell you about data protection, but they do not speak about racial bias, exclusion, um, and so on. And the other thing is that policy has a central role, but it's not as dominant as you would assume. So uh, I was a bit baffled sometimes by how little uh, researchers um, involved in the project actually did care for policy um, and were familiar with it, because it, I think it has more, um, this, this shows more that uh, people think it in the calls, but then it's not really followed through in the entire project. Um, and how could you, so what do I make out of this is more or less the dis disparity of goals um, and reality in terms of the project uptake in the end, in you develop a project, but nobody actually uses it. There is this question of failure. So are those programs actually failing what they want to do or are they successful in something else? Um, also, what I found interesting is that with bringing in the security actors, there has been a power shift from the industry to state security actors in the gender setting, because industry now more or less has a diminished role in defining the objectives because security actors um, have become more powerful. And there is quite a bit of skepticism in those security acts towards industry because they don't feel that industry can fulfill what they need. Um, what is also quite interesting in terms of the imaginaries is that those imaginaries, they promote European solutions and secure Europe through control. And this reflects in, in the calls, but also in like this strong sense of research and development is not only a program to, you know, um, provide some tools for security challenges, but promote a certain way of European security. And this, of course, has a very colonial, post-colonial, um, an exclusionary vision and, and uh, also quite militarized vision, of course, because Europe wants to establish itself as a civil security power in this uh, and globally uh, compete with um, other um, regions where there is a lot of security innovation, say Israel, say South Korea, or even the US. Um, and what the projects, however, do is that they perpetuate a specific fashion of bordering. So 
through this policy link, although it's not followed through, um, the pure fact that there is the policies reflecting the calls and the projects are proposed in, in those calls, um, it heavily politicizes a process that is more or less perceived as purely technical and uh, as I said, a, a, as a, a bringer of modern solutions, so it's it's quite uh, it's it's also quite of a um, you could say it, you could question modernism through all of this. And I think with this, I will conclude and hand over to Sarah. I think it is my turn. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you, Clemens, for inviting me to, to discuss this uh, very interesting work uh, on a such important topic uh, of the role played by the technologization of security practices at the EU border. Um, I have to say I really enjoyed reading uh, this paper because I think it highlights quite well um, the main issues that are currently at stake regarding border security in the EU, but more broadly in, in Western societies. Um, and it also focuses on uh, an understudied empirical material, in my opinion, uh, the EU funded research programs. And I think this study, this study provides uh, important elements to better understand uh, what imaginaries um, and feed border security perceptions uh, uh, of the of the EU. So I I really enjoy uh, the paper um, and um, and also I have to 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 confess I I enjoy this paper also in a more selfish way because uh, it focuses on a on a topic that interests me uh, a lot uh, the role of uh, EU research and development program which aims to to fund diverse innovation uh, projects in Europe. So that is why I find I find convincing your argument, Clemens, uh, that studying these research programs is very important to better understand how technological innovations contribute to shaping policy and and and, and practice uh, um, at the at the contemporary EU borders. So of course the, the question is how, um, and you argue that this is um, a kind of uh, recipro reciprocal um, relationship since the, the development of, of these new devices th through these research programs would both enact and shape uh, uh, border control policies. Um, and to do so, you, you draw on SES, um, uh, critical security studies and, and feminist approaches to, to study more everyday practices rather than exceptional or, or global practices uh, or policies, and I think that allows you to to analyze uh, the productive role of the research and development uh, in policy making, and the kinds of imaginaries of security that are driving both the research program on border security, and the EU uh, policy on border control. So, starting from this, I I will try to raise a few questions and and comments. Um, that um, that I find uh, relevant to 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 this paper. Um, I will try to to start with the, the your conclusion uh, in your presentation. You you presented uh, your 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 first results, uh, and this is of course something that uh, I really wanted to 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 ask you more about. Uh, I was really uh, curious to to see. Um, the kind of uh, uh, results you, you were able to find because the paper was, of course, uh, the introduction of your thesis. I uh, only had a few elements uh, and, and more hypothesis that you, you, you had uh, starting your, your research. So my, my first question will be to, to, to ask you more about your, your current results and maybe it, it will provide you more, more, more time to, to, to detail uh, your, your results. Um, I was wondering if you if you find any uh, surprising elements uh, during uh, this investigation, and were any of your assumptions uh, confirmed or disconfirmed, uh, and also what kinds of imaginary, since you are uh, using this uh, 
uh, this, uh, this concept that I also find very interesting. Uh, what kinds of imaginaries were you able to identify within uh, these projects? And maybe a, a, another uh, question um, in the same topic. Uh, I was also wondering if you were able to, um, to observe some um, surprising and interesting topics uh, well, I mean, emerging from the, 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 your, your investigation. So that will be my first set of questions. Um, and this first set of question equals to my second set of questions um, that is uh, related to your methodology. Um, you mentioned your, your ambition of conducting a, a situational analysis. Um, I think it's a very interesting uh, method, uh, also quite challenging uh, method to, to apply. Um, and my knowledge on this method is that it is really useful uh, when you have a very diverse empirical materials. Yet, um, you, you seem to have chosen to analyze interviews, policy documents, and project reports. Uh, and I wonder if this is the most appropriate method here. I understand that you had to, to cancel the uh, in person I participant observation because of the COVID situation. Um, so I think, and, and maybe it's more common than, than a question, but um, if you really think that this is a method that is the best to, to support your argument, I, I suggest maybe adding another type of observations, um, perhaps by attending or, or viewing online conferences organized by those research project teams. Um, I'm sure you, you can find some of them or eventually uh, EU parliament debates on the topic, etc. I think um, it would this would provide you uh, with empirical elements that would help you to, to make more sense of, of some of the observations you, you have made from, from the documents and the interviews. And uh, regarding uh, your, your field work and the interviews you, you, you had uh, the occasion to, to conduct, uh, I guess, uh, uh, online, uh, but maybe you, 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 could, uh, you could maybe um, precise more uh, the condition of those interviews. I also wanted to ask you if you had uh, the chance to interview actors who were directly involved uh, in this uh, research and development project. Um, and also, I, I was also uh, wondering um, uh, which projects uh, precisely did you decide to analyze more specifically here? Uh, because it seems that there is a, a, a lot of different projects, right? And um, uh, if I remember well, they are not necessarily uh, uh, labeled uh, as a border security uh, projects. So I was wondering how you choose uh, those projects that you wanted to, 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 to study more precisely, um, how many projects you were able to identify uh, in, in your, in your, as an empirical uh, material here to, to, to analyze. Um, yeah. I will stop here on, on, on the field work. Um, to come back to your central question, uh, I also, uh, in the end, it is the technologies as devices that reshape the borders, or is it the ideology of socialism that reshapes uh, border management? And I'm I'm asking this because I'm. When I was reading your your your, your paper, I was um, I was thinking of uh, Martina Tascioli's work, uh, for example, on on borders and migration. That you actually uh, quote, um, especially at, at Greek and Italian borders, who observe that at the end of the day, technologies uh, play seems to play a small role in terms of border control or border security, but they obstruct instead the, the asylum procedures. Um, so I want to, to maybe uh, invite you to reflect more on, on, on this. Um, I was also thinking of um, uh, Karine Cote-Boucher's work on customs. I don't know if you had the chance to, to, to read the, this book, but she um, also highlights the frictions uh, that the implementation of new technologies uh, creates um, instead of speeding and improving security 
and circulation of goods at the Canadian and US borders. So just a, a couple of, of examples that um, I think echoes to what you are trying to describe here um, that, that I think could be interesting to, to engage with. Um, I still have several questions, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. So I would choose uh, maybe a last one, um, maybe one on, on something that, that surprised me. Um, uh, I will say um, the almost absence of knowledge. Um, I, indeed, the notion of knowledge is, uh, is barely mentioned here, uh, even though it seems to me uh, to be at the heart of, of the questions of the imaginaries that are at stake in EU politics and practices uh, of border security. Um, I think you interestingly started to mention uh, an, an example uh, that I, I actually also had the occasion to, to question previously with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Médéric Martin Mazé, the case of the role of the researchers involved uh, in those projects. Uh, and I think it might be interesting to identify the type of knowledge they are bringing within these uh, imaginaries at stake. So um, yeah, I wanted to ask you if uh, that is a deliberate choice. Uh, do you think that is not accurate to your analysis? Or do you actually uh, engage with the question of knowledge production dissemination later in, in your thesis? And if yes, um, how do you do that? Um, and I think I will stop here uh, by uh, thanking you again uh, for sharing uh, this work with us. Um, I think you are doing an important work that contributes to better understanding of power relations produced at the border. So thank you and good luck for the end of your thesis. Wow, that is wonderful um, engagement. Thank you so much, Sarah. Clemens, before you pick and choose, what to respond to now? And then, you know, obviously you can reflect upon all of this as well too. Um, Saskia had a quick question. Um, and this is more of, you know, the, the research that, or the practices that you're describing generally affect all policy oriented research programs and processes. And so Saskia just um, is asking you to reflect upon what is specific or especially problematic about the field of border security or not then. So that's another tag on question for you and I'll give the floor to you. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Sarah, for the, the uh, quite extensive comment and the really help to think this more. And I think I, I'll try to at least address everything in, in, in brevity. Um, but I think it should work. So the, the first question for the for the that you had for the results were there surprising elements. Yes, actually a lot. And because you asked if my assumptions were confirmed or disconfirmed, the most of them were disconfirmed, which I think was a also that being my PhD research quite revealing. That's um, and I'm happy that it is the way it worked. That I actually sat there after like the first five interviews I did and was like, "Hey, this is not what I expected." So um, particularly, I think in terms of when you read and and. As you know, because you have also worked on this, there has not been quite a lot of literature on this before, I would say, 2020. And I wrote the proposal for this in 2017, 2018. So uh, basically what I was relying on to were NGO reports. And those NGO reports, they are very helpful, but they tend to, in my opinion, overestimate the role of the industry. Um, and then when I, I um, talked to policy people and they were like, no, actually, we are not really happy that industry is in there. That was quite interesting to see. And it is also quite, you know, the tra trajectory, how this entire security research program developed, not only in border security, but particularly, of course. Um, I would say that this was really, really interesting in seeing how that the power structures are actually a lot different to to what I assumed um, them to be. Um, the same actually happened for, and I think that was the most surprising element for me is that I thought, you know, there is funding, there is always this argument of, you know, EU money is taxpayers' money. So uh, though I, I thought that those projects would actually, you know, be used in the end. And that one of the major topics was there is no uptake of them and we have to improve this. And this has been, you know, more or less, more or less the, the storyline that guided me, guided me through this um, was really interesting and also challenged me to think this anew. Um, 
And I think this reflects also in the question of imaginaries, but I think like the major imaginary, uh, the major two imaginaries that I found out were the ones of, we can secure the border through technology, which I think is really interesting. Like, you know, this mobility control and we can find out, uh, we, speaking from, from you know, EU people, to, EU people who told me we could, um, find out who is dangerous who is not by you know biometrics and whatever and improve the database speed and speed up the process which also is quite interesting you know and it, it, it is not always fortification in the imaginary it's sometimes it's even acceleration that is um highlighted strongly but it's also this thing of finding european solutions and i think this also then connects to the question that saskia has with, which i will address in a second um for the methodology why i think situational analysis is helpful is particularly for the second set of maps that the methodology provides which is the situational uh the, the social worlds and the social arenas maps which mainly you know um focuses on where how different actors um and different policies and all the elements of the situation interact so this is quite the interesting um the, this is where I feel like it was the most helpful in actually structuring all those wide elements because it was a field I was not really familiar with in the beginning. And then I delved into it and I was a bit overwhelmed by how much there was and structuring this into different smaller social worlds. And I have a chapter on this later in my in my thesis. So, of course, um, this will be addressed. Um, how those different worlds constitute but also interact and where there might be you know where the cross boundaries and 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 stuff like that i think it was really helpful in this um and and um with you know depicting relations and positions in this so this is where i feel like it was the proper methodology to use also i did um observe a few online events um of projects but i feel like you know a lot gets lost that you could observe there particularly in terms of informal um interactions which i think is a huge part of of this but anyway i mean i i will be able to use them but i do not really um see them as a crucial part in my methodology it's just like more or less add up if something interesting comes in there but um it's mainly of course the interviews um, and that's all, this also leads to the question of if I ask actors that are directly involved in project. Yeah, actually, a third of my interviews were with actors that were directly involved in there. Um, the selection was a bit arbitrary in the beginning, um, but it was more or less um, finding out, you know, I started with speaking to policy people and I started to speak into uh, asking them if they had any best case examples of this also because I was interested. And if there were a few projects that they mentioned actually and you know from this if policy people talk more about it i felt like there was more relevance to it uh also i tried to you know look on um which projects were invited for example by frontex to their research um and industry days and then um contact the projects directly who were involved there um so this made it a bit easier in looking at which projects were found to be interesting and crucial by security actors um, in order to get the a stronger connection there. Um, so yeah, that was, was, was more or less what helped me choose in which projects. Of course, the, then there's also the thing in um, how, respo uh, how responsive they were and who actually was the, the project lead, because it's usually like the project leader that I interviewed. Um, and it depended on the institution if it was easier to get contact or or more difficult so quite practical um and then i i think i take the two questions together the last one um if i'm interested because i think that the question in technology knowledge and the the or the ideology of solutionism that interests me um is is interesting um knowledge was a contentious topic for me i didn't really struggle with with um trying to get this in and it is still in there so it comes a bit strong in the later chapters particularly in um uh, more analyzing the knowledge that is brought in by the non-research actors because i find it quite interesting that you know 
um, that was also something that everybody in the project told me that they uh, had they they were doing their own surveys with um, the security actors and security practitioners um, in order to get their needs. So it's more or less they not extract, but they they gather the knowledge from the security actors and then you know. Uh, process it in, in, in the project. So I think like the interesting part in there is the knowledge that comes in from, from the security side that then shapes how researchers who are actually, you know, regarded as those who produce knowledge, they actually don't really produce, but rather process it in this regard. And their role becomes a bit diminished um, in producing their own knowledge and critically, you know, engage with knowledge. Um, so it is, I mean, I think the interest, the most interesting part for me was to see this ideological element of the innovation and technology as a bringer of um, solutions for crisis situations, for um, whatever happens at the border we can address with the technology. I, I felt like this was interesting in dismantling a bit in, in showing, okay, well, um, this is not only meant to be that, but with this we promote, a st or the EU promotes a certain way of bordering, and there it connects. So I think this is the, the most important element. But of course, this involves the and a further engagement with the specifics of the technologies, because um, as I showed in the beginning, when you introduce something like an artificial intelligence border guard, lie detector thing. Um, it promotes a certain way that, um, again, also connects to the problematizations of, of race, of discrimination, and speaking of the, um, of the SONA canon, even violence in this regard. So I think that it, it's still important to engage with the technologies, although um, because it's not as focused on in the research programs, also not overestimate the role, because in, in the end, um, the politics happened through the calls, the politics happened through funding decisions, uh, and the device itself is, in this sense, it's, it's not just a tool, but it's not as productive as it would be if I analyzed it from a different standpoint. So it's not, I'm not saying that it's not productive at all, but from my standpoint, I feel like um, it's somehow interchangeable which device comes out there, because it's more or less the um, the imaginary that drives the project that is the interesting thing that is is behind there and if the imaginary is um, you know um, people are deceiving and liars more bluntly said it's quite interesting in seeing how this is addressed but if it's through artificial intelligence or if they find another way uh, I think this this is not the major topic but it's more or less the ideology that is that this is based on um, and connecting to Saskia's question if that it's true policy oriented is for for the entirety of the security research programs and I think not only for the security research programs but for all applied research that happens within the framework programs what is problematic about the field of border security is first of all the question of border security, border control, still being a field of national sovereignty more strongly than a lot of other security fields. Um, because there is a stronger cooperation, for example, in counterterrorism or in biodefense, but in, in terms of border security, it's still um, a nationalism in there, which also goes to procurement, which also goes to the way the nation states still do it. And this is, of course, changing with the strengthening of Frontex and Frontex becoming a proper border police, more or less, but um, it's still there that um, nation states do insist on their decision making in there. It's also that the border has specific characteristics in terms of how it's being regarded as a secure as an object to secure and to control um, and it interconnects with um, topics of mobility as we, I mean, we have seen this right now. I think COVID has shown us the way um, that borders are very much there and how on how many grounds movement and mobility can be controlled and hindered. Um, so I think that this connection is, is really interesting. And also, I mean, it's just 
Um, it's a bit of a case study also. It's just I selected it because of those reasons that it's um, there is this impediment through the strong nationalism in there. There is this strong connection to mobility, which brings this ambiguity of, on the one hand, accelerate mobility for um, white work, white white collar um, workers, and leave um, you know, racialized migrants out there, um, which is stronger visible there as let's say for example in counterterrorism although of course counterterrorism is also a field where this this emerges um and as we all know um border security is connected also to issues of counterterrorism in this regard so um but yeah and also it's it's because border security is still in this weird um on this weird boundary between military and um policing and I feel like this is also quite interesting that um, in some points there are military forces, but in some points it's just the police that is involved. And this also means something, something more for internal security purposes. And I think in looking at the border, we can learn a lot about um, internal security and policing in general, which I feel also is quite important. That's so wonderful, Clemens. And we're out of time, but I just want to quickly ask as my role of chair too, is um, thinking about really, um, what is your hope for your research? Like what, to, what do you want? Who do you want to read your work? What do you want to get? Uh, that's probably a really tough question. So, um, but who do you want you to read your work and, and what would be your biggest hope arising from your research and your broader contribution? Well, um, getting to my PhD. <laughs> No, um, no, of course. I mean, the the um, I I think it's worthwhile, and I think that what, what interested me is in looking not only how technologies are used, but actually where did they come from. It's always this product, this this side of production, um, which is also, of course, a very uh, political economy part uh, in there. So I think that. It opens up, and I hope to achieve this, to open up a further discussion about different elements of this, about, uh, you know, of course, also the political economy of this all, which I do not address at all, because I think that would, this would just lead to, to overboard um, and to, to, you know, it would be overboarding in, in, in a sense. Um, but also in terms of, you know, how through different, pro so when, we look at, at border security, we have those imaginaries, so to say, of, you know, um, the border guard um, there. And I, I feel like it's interesting to, and there are other people who have done a bit of work on that, but to systematically address this and to see research is not only a process in the laboratory, research is not only an administrative process, but it's this intersection of uh, administrating and doing research. So there is a lot of, of topic uh, uh, of topics that intersect in there and um, this interconnection of, of politics with something that is regarded as depoliticized. So opening up the discussion there and just showing, okay, well, this is there. We have not really looked at this as um, academic community. We recently just started looking at this. Um, and there is a, a growing body of literature, and, and I think that this moves into a good direction in opening up the, the different aspects of um, what is addressed there. Um, it's also, you know, questioning in what is done at another, another dimension at the EU border that I feel like is going into the, and this is the critical um, dimension of the research, which I feel is just going wrong, relying on this, yeah, if we just develop technologies, it's going better and it just exacerbates any problem that there is and it discriminates against people on the move and, and puts them in uh, jeopardy. So I think that there is also this, this very critical element to it, um, which people particularly in this, in this field um, that I, I, I talk to often do not really, I think, reflect sufficiently upon. Um, so also shed light a bit on this. 